um, Dr. Spencer Gibson, who um, uh, also hopefully has recovered from the Game 4 loss in Winnipeg, is going to come and uh, uh, give us uh, an update and overview of um, uh, the Canadian research uh, landscape. Uh, Dr. Gibson uh, has been heavily invested in CLL research, particularly on the basic uh, uh, side, uh, has been um, uh, an extremely uh, valuable collaborator across, across uh, many groups, including the NCIC, and, and, uh, and, and, and involved in a number of correlative projects, and I think is uh, poised to, um, uh, to, to, to give us an excellent update as to the uh, contributions that are being made across our country. So, uh, Spencer. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, and I am humbled to uh, be talking uh, after Dr. Halleck and Dr. Keating, who are truly the superstars in CLL, and hopefully I can give you a Canadian perspective of what research is going on and how what we do interlate with what the previous uh, talks have uh, illustrated to you. First, I want to say that um, my title has changed in that I'm now the Interim Director of the Research Institute of Oncology and Hematology, and the reason why that's significant is, is that this is an attempt to integrate all areas of cancer research under one institute within Manitoba, and so it will include oncologists, it will include population-based scientists, as well as basic scientists. And the reason why this is important will be illustrated later in my talk. So, this is about the Canadian perspective, so I brought up a map of Canada and where our population is. Canada is the second largest nation in the world, but our population is 35,000. I'm sorry, 30, yeah, about 35,000. It's about the size of a California. Yeah, so it is spread over a huge territory. But what you have to understand, though, is, is that we are, most of our population is within 100 miles of the U.S. border. So we have this thin layer across the country. So what are the advantages of doing research in Canada? Well, first, I have to give you the spotlight of what is a CLL patient in Canada. The incidence of CLL uh, is about 8 out of 100,000 people, which is similar to the incidence uh, in other countries. The male to female ratio is around 1.3 to 1. And the relative survival is poor as you age. So over 75 years have a lower overall survival relative to their uh, age match peers as opposed to younger patients. And this is in 1999 to 2003. And the reason I say that is, is that that's before rituximab became the standard therapy. So it will be interesting as we go forward to see what happens with these uh, older patients. Another important point was is when we looked at the clinic in Manitoba, we found that the average age was around 67, not the 72, which has been reported for CLL. So this has actually changed practice in Manitoba in which we actually send a letter to uh, physicians stating that there is a CLL clinic at the cancer center and to refer the patients to us or consult us. This has led to an increase in the average age within the clinic to closer to 70 years of age. And as Dr. Johnson indicated, that there was a equal survival of these older patients within the clinic. So the reasons for this we don't know, but it is part of ongoing research. As other speakers have indicated, there's also an increased risk of second cancers in CLL patients, about a twofold, and it's mainly skin cancers. This in Manitoba has led us to have a dermatologist within the CLL clinic that sees patients as they arrive so that we can detect these cancers early and put patients on screening programs so that we can uh, impact them. But the point I want to say is, is that the average CLL patient in Canada is very similar to the average CLL patient in Europe and in the United States. So what are the advantages of doing CLL research in Canada? Well, we do have one healthcare system with one provider. So this will allow us to actually track patients and do patient population-based studies. Canadian scientists have been trained around the world and have come back and set up research facilities here in Canada. And with our provinces, we have provincial cancer agencies that can provide the opportunity for CLL patients to be, take part in CLL-related studies, such as uh, understanding the CLL populations in general. However, there are challenges to research in Canada. 
One of the challenges, which is not faced by larger centers, is that we have a lack of resources for instituting clinical trials. There is a new program being spearheaded by um, the Canadian Partnerships Against Cancer to try to increase these resources in the country, but it still becomes a challenge, and especially if it's an investigator-initiated clinical trial. Also, as other speakers have mentioned, there is a lot of biomarkers associated with CLL, but each center has their own repertoire of biomarkers that they track for various re reasons that are uh, for the center that they are located in. So one thing that we need to do is to try to get more standardized approaches so that we can compare data from one center to the next. Also, there needs to be um, established CLL clinical databases that can be shared. So each center collects CLL data, but they collect different aspects of CLL data depending upon what they're interested in. We need to have a network of common data shared across the country, and we're working towards that. And finally, funding. You need to do research. You need to have money to do it. And in Canada, this is a challenging landscape. And as you can see here, this is a graph of cancer research funding from 2008 to 2012, with the red bar indicating basic science, the purple representing uh, treatment research, and the rest other pillars of cancer research. What I want to point out here is, is that treatment costs have continued to go up, and so research in that area has gotten an increase in funding, while the funding for basic science has gone down. We're suggesting is, is that it overall provides a very flat landscape in terms of funding. So as a group, we have to work closer together in order to have a more effective uh, way of doing research so that we have, because uh, we'll have to do this in less dollars. In order to increase research, we in Manitoba have established the CLL Tumor Bank within the Manitoba Tumor Bank. This is a bank in which we will be able to store CLL blood samples, and this has been established through our foundation and with Dr. Johnson and myself spearheading it. Right as of today, we have over 900 patients consented to the bank and over 10,000 samples actually banked. This year, we hope to break 1,000 patients consented. These samples are available to all researchers within Canada, and we collaborate with researchers not just in Canada, from around the world, in order for them to use this resource. We collect these samples not to store them, but to use them. We also collaborate with the clinical trials networks in Canada to store patient samples on clinical trial so that researchers can do translational studies understanding how, why or how these uh, experimental therapeutics have worked. We also collect various biomarkers for these CLO cells so that we can distribute it to researchers across Canada. As you've seen in previous talks, there is a large amount of biomarkers in CLO. It's truly a biomarker disease. And we have attempted to collect all these biomarkers within our tumor bank. But one of the questions we asked was, is the CLL patient in Canada presenting with these biomarkers the same as what has been presented by other centers? So we have done the mutational analysis of the immunoglobulin gene and looked at treatment-free survival. Now this curve here is opposite to what you would normally see, so the increase actually means less time to treatment. I'm sorry, a shorter time to treatment, and the mutation below line is longer time for uh, treatment. So the treatment-free survival is better in the mutated patients as opposed to the unmutated patients, which is exactly what the researchers in Europe and in the United States have shown. So the CLL patients in our bank are similar to what has, you would see in other centers. We now have 80% of our CLL bank patients with mutational status. And we also have 60% that have ZAP70 st status, which has been associated with the mutational status of the immunoglobulin gene. We have further established uh, databases for the clinical outcomes for these patients and established the CLL bank through the course of the disease. What I mean by that is that we just don't 
bank a patient at the time they hit the clinic. We bank them each year thereafter, so we have a complete course of their disease so that we will be able to study different questions in terms of CLL biology. Furthermore, we are creating a bioinformatics database so that we can link the information that we get from the CLL sample to the clinical information so that we can answer questions that we wouldn't normally be able to do. And we want to link this database, as I told you before, to other databases in Canada so that we can have a bigger repertoire of CLL patients and be able to answer questions. So that's the uh, foundations or infrastructure of CLL uh, in, in our center. But I wanted just to take the rest of my talk to give you a cross-Canada tour of the CLL research that's occurring. So I'm going to start in Vancouver where we have Dr. Cindy Toes, who's an MD who specializes in bone marrow transplant of CLL. And she has a database of CLL patients in that province and has linked them to the FISH data that Dr. Keating uh, talked to you about in his talk and tried to look at characteristics that are associated with these um, patients, such as clonal evolution um, and the degree of abnormalities within uh, the uh, genomic uh, DNA. But furthermore, she's also taken this data and looked at the Asian population within BC. And what she's found is, is that the Asian population, if they immigrated from Asia to BC, as those generations proceed, the incidence of CLL is equivalent to what is you would expect in North America. The reason I say that is, is that the incidence of CLL in Asian countries is much lower than what you see in North America, suggesting that the CLL in Western countries has some environmental factors associated with it or lifestyle. Furthermore, she is uh, doing research on bone marrow transplants to see how patients respond and looking at this question of fit and unfit patients and how that relates to age. So in the past, patients were uh, stratified for bone marrow transplant based on age. And what has occurred in the last uh, five or six years is that this has been changed to how fit the patient is for bone marrow transplant, and age is becoming less of a factor. And she's looking also at why these transplants fail and try to identify factors that might improve it moving forward. In Calgary, six years ago, there was no CLL research. But when Caroline Owen came, she established a CLL-based practice that then has led to the establishment of clinical trial protocols within uh, the Foothills Hospital uh, in Calgary. And now they have three open trials going on, and they have done five overall in the last few years. She stated to me that this is a perfect place for doing these kind of studies because we don't have the private practitioners who could draw patients away from the academic centers, so now we can enroll them on clinical research studies. And she is also the organizer of our annual CLL meeting in Winnipeg. And this will continue to develop these collaborative networks to increase the amount of CLL research across the country. I'm skipping now to Toronto. I'm skipping over Winnipeg for last. <laughs> you know why. Uh, I'm going to talk about David Spanner. So I think some of you in this audience know Dr. Spanner. He is a researcher and clinician at Sunnybrook Hospital. And when I emailed him saying, can you tell me what you're doing in terms of your research program, he emailed me 20 slides to present. Uh, I'm not presenting 20 slides. So I'm giving you three slides of his research. So he's interested in two basic problems. One is the watch and wait phase of management in CLL. Is there a better way that we can improve patients in this watch and wait phase so that it prolongs the time for them they need treatment? And a second one is, how can we improve the kinase-based treatments that you've heard today in CLL so that we can minimize the toxicity and increase the effectiveness? So he's studying statins, which is involved in treatment of cardiovascular disease, and seeing if patients who are on this drug have a different uh, watch and weight management as compared to other patients. So can they have longer uh, periods of time before they need treatment. Furthermore, he is also looking at another kinase-inhibiting drug called 
reluxolitinib, which I, I, don't, I can never pronounce these uh, names because they're so long, but the idea behind this drug is he wants to target this uh, class of kinases in unfit first-line chemotherapy and see if he can make this more effective in combination. Initial results of using this drug show that it is tolerable in CLL patients, and in the future, he wants to combine it with the other kinase inhibiting drugs, such as the So I'm going on now to Montreal, where Dr. Raquel Alois is interested in B cell signaling, which is, plays an important role in the biology of CLL. But I'm not going to show you a kinase uh, signaling pathway, because I think you've seen en enough of those today. But what I want to show you here with her is she wants to understand with downstream of the B cell signaling, is there a change in metabolism? Because cancer cells change the metabolism to survive so that they can proliferate, so they can survive in different microenvironments. And CLL is no different in that change in metabolism. So by understanding the metabolism, maybe you can target this for therapy, and maybe you can combine it with BCL receptor inhibitors, such as abrutinib or asalinib, and see how this can affect the outcome of CLL cells. And then identify metabolic inhibitors that could be effective as well. And so this is my schematic of how this can work. So we talked about the inhibitors of BTK and PI3 kinase. We also talked about rituxa rituximab, but what she's interested in is how can we use metabolic inhibitors in this area of uh, therapy so that we can have more effective therapies. My next two cities are Edmonton and Ottawa together. The reason I put these two together is to give you the illustration that not all CLL cells or CLL patients are created equal. So Dr. Brent Sankey at the University of Ottawa is interested at looking at SNPs within marker proteins that could be a indicator of patients that get toxic side effects of getting fludarabine. So not all patients get the same responses with fludarabine-based therapies. And his hypothesis is, is that there are enzymes within the cell that have mutations that make the patient more sensitive to this drug. If true, this could get a marker to determine what patients get what therapy. Dr. Linda Polarski, who's at the University of Alberta, is looking at subclonal populations of CLL cells. So we all know that CLL patients are all different. They all have different markers. They all have different courses of disease. What is underappreciated is, is that CLL cells within each individual patient are different as well. So there's subpopulations of cells that are biologically different than their neighbor cells. And by defining what those cellular populations are, it could give us a clue as to why some patients relapse or why some patients become outright resistant to different therapies. And so this is ongoing work in her lab. Finally, but not last, I'll talk about Winnipeg. So Dr. James Johnson, who I uh, talked to you earlier today, has a research interest in telomeres. These are the short ends of DNA within cells that makes them stable. And in CLL patients, it's been demonstrated, become very short. And maybe this can have implications on why you see so many genetic uh, alterations within CLL cells. And he's interested in seeing how that correlates to how they respond to therapy. And how does these new therapies correlate with this uh, shortening of the telomeres? Also, he has an interest in population-based studies to know what are the effects of aging and secondary malignancies on CLL patients. Dr. Varsha Banerjee is another clinician scientist in Winnipeg who has also an interest in the metabolism of CLL. And by understanding how metabolism is altered in CLL, you can divide novel therapies to target it. And she has developed two new drugs that target metabolism that are under investigation right now that we hope will eventually end up in clinical trials to see if we can change the metabolism within CLL cells that can make it a targeted therapy. Finally, but not least, myself. So I'm interested in this balance of cell survival, cell death. Why does a CLL cell survive? under all these different stresses and environments? And why does it survive and relapse following therapy? 
I'm also interested in getting to know why kinase inhibitors work and can we target this to a subset of CLL cells that have overexpression of a tyrosine kinase called ZAP70. We've identified a kinase inhibitor that seems to be selectively toxic to this ZAP70 positive cell. And we want to take this kinase inhibitor, which is FDA approved, called Jafitnib, and put it into a clinical trial to see if we can effectively target this pathway selectively in CLL patients. Beyond this, we have a new uh, target called the lysosome. The lysosome is kind of like the stomach of a cell. It's there to digest enzymes and proteins that are no longer of use within the cell. And if you use disruptors of this, apparently CLL cells are very sensitive to this inhibitor. But I don't want to explain this research. I want my graduate student to explain it. So this is new for me. This is going to be a YouTube video of my graduate student, uh, Rebecca Del Schneider, who won the three-minute thesis. What three-minute thesis is, is three minutes describing your project to a lay audience, making the audience want more. She won the university-wide three-minute thesis and on Wednesday is going to compete in the Western Canada finals in this country. Everyone here knows the devastation of cancer. For anything like me, you've lost colleagues, neighbors, friends, and family. Now imagine the cells of your immune system, the cells that should protect you from cancer, actually becoming cancerous themselves. This is leukemia, and this is what motivates me to work hard in the lab every day. I study the most common leukemia in North American adults chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The number of new cases each year in Canada alone would fill this auditorium to capacity 10 times over, and this incidence rate keeps rising. To make matters worse, this disease is frequently resistant to drug treatment and is without cure. But what if a cure was as simple as popping a balloon? I believe it is. The balloons which I aim to pop inside leukemic cells are called lysosomes. Lysosomes are the recycling centers inside each of our cells. They are acidic, balloon-like structures that are full of not just water, but also enzymes and reactive compounds, which break down and recycle cellular components. However, when lysosomes pop and release their reactive contents, they initiate cell death hence turning from a cellular recycling system into a cellular suicide bag. But is there a way we can selectively pop lysosomes to kill only leukemic cells and spare healthy cells? The exciting results of my research say yes. I've discovered that compared to healthy cells, leukemic cells are so compromised that they have more fragile, more easily poppable lysosomes. To take advantage of this weakness, I tested drugs which target lysosomes, like the dart in this image. These drugs are readily available and are known to be safe. You may have even taken them if you've had depression or malaria, but we had some hints that these drugs could do more, and indeed they can. These drugs disrupted lysosomes, killed leukemic cells, all while sparing healthy cells. Importantly, these drugs were even effective in the most aggressive leukemic cells that current chemotherapy leaves behind. Thus, these drugs are not only safer than current chemotherapy, but they're also more effective. As I continue to fine tune this approach, I believe we are getting closer and closer to turning the idea of popping a balloon into a cure for leukemia. Thank you. So this is time to summarize the research that's going on in Canada. And I can put it into three general categories. The first category is metabolism. This is the new frontier in cancer research. Can we understand metabolism? Can we use it as a target for chemotherapy? And CLL, there is some exciting results suggesting yes, we can. As we just heard in the three-minute thesis, developing new targeted therapies that can be used in combination with the toolbox of chemotherapies we have now is an exciting area in CLL research, and we are continuing to understand how to better use these drugs to treat CLL. And in that vein, 
there's uh, even more researchers looking at something that I call precision medicine. How to use the drugs we have to the patient that will benefit from them. That's going to be the major challenge in CLL moving forward. Can we take the right drug for the right patient at the right time? And this is going to be the challenge for researchers worldwide as we keep increasing the amount of drugs that CLL patients can take. This is where I get excited. There's a new initiative in Manitoba. The provincial government has just awarded our group a collaborative research cluster grant, which I call cluster. <laughs> so this is a grant in which we can bring CLL research together with the sole focus of improving the lives of CLL patients. The reason why I'm excited is that this is $2.5 million towards this initiative. And this is going to be over a five-year period. What it does is it brings your population-based researcher, it brings together your clinician, it brings together the basic scientist, as well as the nurse, to come together with one focus in mind, and that is how can we improve the lives of CLL patients? And how can we combine the knowledge we have so that it can define how a patient can be treated, or how it defines the questions in the lab that we will need to investigate. So what we are going to do is we're going to have population-based studies in which we're going to identify if there is any gaps in care and any preventative drugs that we find in the population to see if we can change the course of CLL. We are also going to conduct clinical trials on these patients with biomarkers of poor prognostic outcome, as well as understanding metabolism and migration of CLL cells. And we will work together as a team as so that we make sure that whatever um, results we have will impact the patient. What makes me even more excited is that the CLL patient advocacy group was with us from the very beginning when we put this project together. There will be a member from this group on the advisory board of this cluster to make sure that any results that we have are focused on the patient and to make sure that the research we do will have an impact. This is how the program's going to work. We're going to use the infrastructure that I talked about, the bank, the clinic, and then have individual projects associated with things that could have impact. This could be patient management, it could be basic understanding, it could be a, a novel targets for chemotherapy, but the priority is the CLO patient. That's going to be the center of whatever we do. If it's not going to help the patient, we're not going to do it. And as a group, we will define what those goals are. This is how it's going to work. We're going to bring together the areas of population, basic, and clinical sciences together under the overlapping goal within our projects to see if we can have questions that we can answer that can change the management of CLL. And we hope by doing this in the next five years to have actually measurable change. This is something that is new for us in Manitoba, and it is a relatively uh, new model within a cancer center. And we hope that this model, not just for CLL, but for other cancers, will be able to have a success. So we're going to use CLL as our model moving forward. And how we're going to bring together other researchers outside of Winnipeg? Well, that's where our national CLL meeting comes in. We held this each year in Winnipeg in which we bring together researchers within Canada and from around the world to share their results. And recently, we've added trainees to our uh, program so that the trainees can interact with each other and share their data. So this is knowledge translation. We can take our knowledge, present it to the community, and they can use that knowledge to further their own research and to increase collaboration. Finally, my last slide, the next CLL conference will be on October 4th and 5th in Winnipeg, and go Jets go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Spencer. That was just a uh, fantastic uh, talk. 
Um, I th obviously, uh, yeah, yourself and Dr. Johnston and the whole group there in Winnipeg should really be applauded for their efforts, not only in your own right, but by just uh, extending the, uh, or connecting researchers across the country, your collaborative nature. Maybe it's a prairie thing, but it's, it's, uh, it's very impressive. Um, and congratulations to you both. Um, we have... <laughs> I, I kind of wondered if maybe the new patient referral might go up by about 150 <laughs> in, in the next few weeks. Um, so we do have uh, a, a few minutes uh, for questions before we break, if there's any questions for Dr. Gibson. Uh, hello, Dr. Gibson. Uh, this is in reference to the short video that the young lady, uh, I didn't get her, sure. her name, uh, presented on metabolic lysosome mm -hmm. uh, treatment. Uh, one thing that is sort of troubling to me as a patient is uh, seeing so much money being put into uh, targeted therapies that uh, target healthy cells as well as unhealthy cells. Yeah. Do you see a justification for the increased uh, use of resources to explore, uh, say, CD20 MABs? And I'm speaking specifically, I mean, obituzumab seems to be uh, uh, quite a, uh, an effective drug. Uh, I may even benefit from that, but uh, you look at uh, ublituximab, which is engineered to um, uh, promote CDC, uh, you know, and I'm just wondering, and also with the CAR-Ts, you can bring the CAR-Ts into yeah. this because mm -hmm. uh, the patients that are treated with CAR-T-19 uh, are essentially wiping out one arm of the immune system. Uh, this is great for people that don't have any other choices, but we need something that has an idiotypic targeting. I'm really glad you asked that question because that is something that is not uh, discussed about more. So like we have all these novel therapies and yes, they can be targeted where seal cells, but they do target normal cells. And this is some of the toxicities we're seeing in these patients. So some of these drugs are going to be very helpful. Some of them are not depending upon the toxicities. And what I mean by toxicities is they target normal cells. So what we are doing in our studies is with the lysosome targeting, we are wondering why do the CLL cells seem to react better than a normal B cell that we use as a control? We even use T cells from the patient themselves as a control to say, what's the toxicity of this drug? And that's why we're using drugs that are out there, FDA approved, that have been shown to be safe in normal, well, I shouldn't say normal individuals, but individuals that do not have CLL, and say, could we then get a therapeutic window where we can really target the CLL cell without all these other cyto um, toxic side effects? And this is especially true for older patients. It seems as the older patients, if there's a side effect, you'll have it. That's a generalization, but it is uh, something that you need to keep in mind. So part of our project and what we're working on is what makes these CLL cells different? And we have some exciting targets. I, they're unproven, but that's exactly what we're looking for in the basic science. How are uh, the samples for your CLL uh, tumor bank, how are they selected? Uh, how are the, the choices made, and are there any criteria or locations in Canada? Canada. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Sorry, uh, your CLL tissue bank for the yes. tumor. Uh, how were they selected? Uh, and how are they? You know, oh. how is that choice made? Um, yes. So patients are selected for the ones that come to our CLL clinic within our cancer center because that's where we can get their um, blood and take it to our um, bank. Now we can get patient samples outside from communities uh, like rural. The problem is, is it's cost. It really costs us a lot to transport the drug and to pay for the drugs to be, or not drugs, the blood to be drawn. So we are kind of limited to our geographical area in that regard. But we are working with other centers uh, in terms of uh, their collection of CLL, and we do share information. So it's just not our center that's collecting it. There's other centers as well. 